Hello, I'm Dr. Kristen Richards of Torrey Pines Dermatology. I'm a fellowship trained Mohs surgeon and a board certified dermatologist. And I'd like to talk to you today about sun care, skin cancer, and you. Skin cancer is the most common form of cancer in the United States. 3.3 million Americans will develop skin cancer in 2020. Basal cell carcinoma is four to five times more common than squamous cell carcinoma. And one person dies of melanoma every hour in the United States. So why the rapid increase in skin cancer? First, we don't have the best sun exposure habits. We're still not great about putting on enough sunscreen, doing it on a daily basis, or reapplying as often as we should. And secondly, the ozone layer continues to deplete. There's a four to five percent increase in UVB reaching the earth at latitudes covering the United States. Ultraviolet radiation comes in two types, UVB, which ranges from 290 to 320 nanometers, and it's the main cause of sunburn and skin cancer and reddening of the skin. It can cause cataracts, immune system suppression, and genetic damage. UVA, in the range of 320 to 400 nanometers, can also cause genetic damage and skin cancer, um, as well as premature aging of the skin. Ionizing radiation, such as X-ray therapy for acne as a, as a kid can lead to skin cancer later, as well as chemicals such as arsenic and coal tars. A recent study in October of this year showed the ozone hole, hole over Antarctica has grown to its maximum size just one year after researchers reported that it was at its smallest since discovery. The hole grew rapidly from mid-August and peaked in early October at about 9.2 million square miles, according to the World Meteorological Organization. So we know that when the ozone layer is depleting, there's a higher incidence of UV rays making it to the earth. The increase in UVB exposure causes an increase in non-melanoma and melanoma skin cancer. There are also higher rates of eye disease, such as cataracts and retinal melanoma, premature aging of the skin, and damage to the immune system. Because the immune system um, can no longer function the way it should, and instead it's immunosuppressed. You might notice after a long day of sun exposure that herpes simplex cold sores come out more commonly, and this is a result of the sun suppressing the immune system preventing it from fighting off the virus that leads to herpes simplex. So we can see that UV exposure on the skin leads to both premature aging and skin cancer. UVA rays tend to go deeper in the skin. They can penetrate to the deeper levels of the dermis and UVB tends to be more superficial, which causes the reddening of the skin. But both rays ultimately can lead to mutations in different skin cells, and as, as a result, different types of skin cancer can pre be produced, including basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and um, melanoma that comes from melanocytes or pigment cells being mutated. On the picture on the right, you can see that the left side of her face is much more damaged than the right. Interestingly, as a Mohs surgeon, I do much more surgery on the left side of the face than the right, simply because people drive without their sunscreen on. So they get much more exposure on the left side of the face than the right. So it's another reminder when you see this kind of a picture to make sure that you're putting your sunscreen on every single morning before you even get dressed on the face, the neck, the ears, and any of the extremities that have sun exposure. A lot of primary care physicians will tell their patients, go ahead, get a little sun. It's good for your vitamin D levels. We as dermatologists take issue with that because ultimately any amount of sun exposure can lead to more UV mutations in the skin and different forms of skin cancer. It's really much safer just to take a vitamin D supplement or get your vitamin D from different food sources 
including those pictured in this slide, salmon, eggs, mushroom, fortified milk, or simply just take a vitamin D3 supplement in the range of 800 to 1,000 international units per day. That way you still get your vitamin D, you boost your immune system, you increase your bone health, but you're not damaging your skin in the process. So there are two types of common non-melanoma skin cancers. There's the basal cell carcinoma, which is the more common type. Eight out of 10 non-melanoma skin cancers are basal cell carcinomas. And there are different subtypes pictured here. We have nodular, pigmented, infiltrative, and superficial. So as you can see, they all look very different. And it's just a reminder to everyone to make sure that they get a baseline with their dermatologist so that if there are any changes, as pictured here, um, those uh, skin cancers can get treated right away. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common cancer in America. It's seen mainly in middle-aged and elderly patients. It's caused by UV radiation and sometimes a genetic predisposition towards basal cell. The most common locations are on the face, the neck, the trunk, and the extremities anywhere basically that sun exposure has occurred. And interestingly, patients often develop another basal cell carcinoma within five years of the first one developing. So it's important to go in for uh, biannual or quarterly checks after developing a skin cancer, not so much uh, because we're worried about the first one recurring, but we're worried more about other ones occurring nearby. Basal cell carcinomas slowly grow over time. Oftentimes patients will report a lesion that is bleeding and then heals up and then starts to bleed again, or they'll notice bleeding on a towel or a pillowcase. And that is always the first sign of a skin cancer. Uh, these uh, carcinomas tend to enlarge over many months to years, and they are capable of, of extensive tissue destruction, even invading into the muscle, cartilage, and bone. The other common type of non-melanoma skin cancer is squamous cell carcinoma, and two out of 10 of non-melanoma skin cancers are squamous cells. Like the basal cell, there are many different subtypes, superficial, keratoacanthoma, infiltrative, and even verrucous that can show up on the bottom of the feet or on the hands. Squamous cell carcinomas are thought to arise mainly on sun-damaged skin, often from a precursor lesion called an actinic keratosis, which is pictured on the right, that is a precancer. Um, they can occur anywhere on the skin, mainly in sun exposed areas, the face, the lips, the mouth, the ears, the dorsal hands, the legs and arms, chest and back, and anogenital areas. Anogenital squamous cells generally arise from a viral precursor, um, just as human papillomavirus leads to cervical cancer, it can also lead to squamous cell carcinoma. So metastasis is more common in squamous cell carcinoma than in basal cell. And you'll see that metastasis occurring more likely in recurrent tumors with a large diameter greater than two centimeters, uh, depth greater than four millimeters, in the mouth, uh, around the ears, um, even squamous cells arising from chronic wounds can metastasize. Uh, squamous cells that grow down nerves have a higher potential for metastasis, and also in immunocompromised patients whose immune systems are not functioning at their full capacity. Other causes of basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma besides UV radiation include a previous burn or injury, and usually squamous cell carcinoma is the uh, carcinoma to develop here. Organ transplant patients tend to get them more commonly due to the immunosuppressive drugs that they're on. Between 10 to 45% of transplant patients will develop skin cancer, um, and usually those skin cancers are squamous cells. So it's extremely important to educate organ transplant patients and immunosuppressed patients to wear their sunscreen every day. As we saw in the previous slide, human papillomavirus can be another cause, and then other inherited rare diseases such as xeroderma pigmentosum, basal cell nevus syndrome, and even albinism 
When you lack pigment in your skin, it's very difficult to block the sun and you're much more predisposed to developing skin cancer. So even though a skin cancer may appear very innocuous on the surface, sometimes it is just the tip of the iceberg. And what you see at the surface is actually just a very small version of what's really going on underneath the surface. And that lesion can be much more extensive and invade much more deeply than you would think by looking at the primary lesion. So it's extremely important when a small lesion appears on your skin that's bleeding and doesn't heal up that you have that checked by your dermatologist um, so that you can catch that lesion early instead of at the later stages. The scariest of all skin cancers is malignant melanoma. Melanomas that are superficial are very treatable. Those that have invaded into the bloodstream or the lymph system uh, have a much higher chance of um, metastasis and death. So it's extremely important when you notice any lesion um, that is dark or growing to have your dermatologist check the lesion right away. Melanoma can appear in almost any part of the body and has many different kinds of appearances, as you can see here. It can occur in the hair, it can occur in the eye, in the mouth and the gums, on the fingernails and toenails. They also appear very differently than um, just a basal cell or a squamous cell. It can be amelanotic, you can have a darker pigmented nodule, or you can have a superficial spreading melanoma of many different colors. So they can be um, very evasive and at the same time very scary because if these lesions are not caught early, uh, they can lead to uh, metastasis and early death. The projected numbers uh, per the American Cancer Society for 2020 were over 100,000 patients diagnosed with over 6,000 deaths with men uh, having more than women. Um, incidence of people under 30 developing melanoma is increasing faster than any other demographic, demographic group soaring by 50% in young women since 1980. And we believe that one of the causes of this is tanning bed exposure. Melanoma is the most common form of cancer for young adults 25 to 29 years old, and the second most common cancer in adolescents and young adults 15 to 29 years old. It is most common in fair-skinned people, but it can strike men and women of all ages and skin types. And California residents have the very highest race rates in the nation due to our uh, very sunny climate year round. In 2020, the estimate for melanoma in California is 10,980 cases and 600 deaths. So how do we diagnose a melanoma? We look for five factors. A is for asymmetry. So the lesion doesn't look nice and round and even. B is for border, if the border is irregular. C is for color. If there are many different colors or dark black next to brown in the lesion. D is for diameter. If the diameter is bigger than a pencil eraser, we pay attention. And E is for evolution. So if this is a rapidly growing lesion that's bleeding, we take note. And these are important factors to think about when examining your own skin. So if we get skin, skin cancer, how do we treat it? Most micrographic surgery has the highest cure rate of all the different forms of treatment for skin cancer. 97 to 99% cure rate for primary tumors and 94% for recurrent tumors. The beauty of most surgery is that it spares healthy tissue because we use the microscope as we go along to trace out the cancer cells. We use it for tumors with contiguous growth on cosmetically important areas. And as compared to other methods, it definitely has the highest cure rate. Standard excision has a cure rate of 89%. Scraping and burning destruction of the skin has a cure rate of 81 to 96%. And radiation has a cure rate of 91%. So if you're going to get a uh, skin cancer on the face, the neck, the ears, the genital region, the hands, in front of the shins, all areas with minimal tissue, um, laxity, and cosmetically important areas, the kind of treatment you get should be Mohs micrographic surgery. 
Mohs micrographic surgery was first developed in the 1930s by Frederick Mohs, for whom it's named, and he was a general surgeon from Wisconsin. The technique has been refined considerably since its inception. It's a labor-intensive, long procedure. However, we get excellent results with very, very small recurrence rates. These are the areas we generally use uh, Mohs surgery in, around the eyes, around the mouth, around the ears, the nose, the hands and feet, and the genitalia, all very cosmetically and functionally important areas. And here's an example of a before and after, after a skin cancer is removed and the repair. Most micrographic surgeons are trained in cosmetic repair as well. So we'll use flaps or grafts if needed, or sometimes just close side to side if it is a smaller lesion. That being said, nobody really wants to have large defects carved out of their face if possible. So what can we do to lessen our chances of skin cancer? There's a common belief that 80% of sun exposure occurs prior to the age of 18. This is absolutely not true. Recent studies show that only about 25% of our lifetime sun exposure occurs before the age of 18. This means the majority of sun damage actually occurs after this time. It is not too late to start protecting your skin. Remember that there's no such thing as a healthy tan. Tanning of any sort damages your skin. What happens is the UV rays enter the skin and then the melanocytes in the skin or the pigment cells produce melanin to try to block the sun's rays from coming in. But if the UV rays exceed what can be blocked by your melanin in your skin, you'll get a sunburn. And any sunburn indicates UV radiation, mutations in the skin cells, and a higher propensity towards skin cancer later. Obviously, skin types matter. Skin types four and above have more pigment in their skin and have an easier time blocking the sun. Skin types one through three are much more susceptible to skin cancer as they don't have enough pigment in their skin to block the sun. It's extremely important to avoid tanning beds. Just one indoor tanning session can increase the risk of developing skin cancer, melanoma by 20%, squamous cell carcinoma by 67%, and basal cell carcinoma by 29%. In 2009, the World Health Organization classified tanning beds as carcinogenic to humans. And in 2011, Governor Jerry Brown banned all teenagers from the use of tanning beds. Remember, spray tans are a much better option, and many of the newer spray tans look very natural. So it's really important to avoid the unregulated damage that a tanning bed can cause. So sunscreen should be all of our best friends. The best form of prevention against skin cancer and early aging is proper use of sunscreen. One of the problems with sunscreen is that people don't put on enough and they don't re reapply frequently enough. So it's extremely important to use at least a shot glass of sunscreen to cover your entire body when you're going to the beach and to reapply every two hours if you're swimming or sweating. More importantly though, is that daily protection with a sunscreen that's cosmetically elegant that you like is your very best way of avoiding skin cancer and premature aging of the skin. And I tell my patients before I even get dressed in the morning, I have my sunscreen on my face, my neck, my chest, and my arms if I'm wearing short sleeve um, shirts to make sure that I'm not working around clothing lines and not getting enough sunscreen on. So remember, apply enough for an entire body at the beach. A shot glass amount is correct. Choose a broad spectrum UVA, UVB sunscreen with an SPF of 30 or greater. Reapply every two hours when sweating and swimming and seek the shade if possible. Remember, sunscreen should, should be an everyday phenomenon. Most of our UV exposure comes from daily small exposures while walking to the store and driving. And a sunburn is really not necessary to get skin cancer. It's just cumulative rays over someone's lifetime that eventually add up into enough mutations and finally into skin cancer. When you're driving, the windshield blocks 94%, but the driver's side only blocks 71%. So as you can see in the picture below, 
this woman has much more severe sun damage and premature aging of her skin on the left side. And as I mentioned previously, we most surgeons do much more surgery on the left side of the face than the right because of driving without sunscreen. So find a sunscreen you love and make sure you put it on every day. What is SPF? SPF is a rating for sunscreens that stands for sun protection factor. An SPF of 30 means that if you would normally burn without sunscreen on after 20 minutes in the sun, you can stay in the sun 30 times as long as you could without the sunscreen or sunblock with the same degree of sunburn. And it measures UVB, not UVA. In June of 2012, the FDA changed their regulations on sunscreen because buying a sunscreen was extremely confusing to consumers. There were way too many labels and way too much wording that didn't make sense to people buying sunscreen. So they established three broad categories that are now on all sunscreen labels. The first one is, the first one is broad spectrum. And um, to determine whether or not over-the-counter sunscreens can be labeled broad spectrum, um, it has to have an SPF of 15 or higher and protect against UVB and UVA, not just UVB. If it only protects against UVB and or has an SPF between two to 14, it is not considered broad spectrum. And the FDA will include on the label that the product is not adequately protect against skin cancer or early aging. The second factor on the bottle is whether or not the sunscreen is water resistant. And there are two categories. The sunscreen is, is either water resistant at 40 minutes or at 80 minutes based on testing. So we can no longer have terms such as waterproof, sweatproof, sunblock, or instant protection listed on sunscreen bottles because they are misleading terms. The third factor is an SPF higher than 50 will only be labeled 50 plus, not 80, not 100, because that gives consumers a false sense of security. If they think they have 100 on their skin, they think they can go to the beach all day, lay out in the sun and not reapply. Ultimately, those are the um, consumers, they get the most sunburns because they're not reapplying after swimming or sweating every two hours, thinking that their SPF 100 has them covered. So there's not adequate evidence that extremely high SPFs make a difference in protection. And these regulations do not apply to sprays, towelettes, washes, or shampoos with SPF. Another thing we can do to really protect ourselves is use UPF clothing. And uh, UPF stands for ultraviolet protection factor. And it, and it indicates how much UV radiation, both UVB and UVA, a fabric allows to reach your skin. For example, a UPF 50 fabric blocks 98% of the sun's rays and allows 2% or 1 50th to penetrate, thus reducing your exposure risk significantly. Another really important um, thing to do on a monthly basis is a self skin check. And it's important just like women are encouraged to do monthly breast exams to do your own skin check at home. So you wanna take your clothes off, standing facing the full length mirror, check your chest, shoulders, and arms, as well as under each arm, and look down the front of the thighs and the calves. Then bend your elbows and examine your forearms and the backs and palms of your hands, your fingers on all sides, and your fingernails, remembering that melanoma can even show up in the fingernail. Then get a hand mirror and check the backs of your legs and the bottom of your feet. Also be sure to check between the toes, the size of the toes and the toenails. Then check the back of your neck, part your hair, and if possible, use a blow dryer to move your hair around to check your scalp. Finally, use the hand mirror to examine the buttocks, the genitalia, and the lower back. And if this skin check is done on a monthly basis, you will really assist your dermatologist in locating lesions that have recently occurred and you'll be able to get those lesions treated on a much uh, more expedited fashion. So how to avoid skin cancer? Sunscreen, sunscreen, sunscreen. Remember to reapply every two hours, to put on enough, and to get in the habit of wearing a sunscreen that you like on a daily basis. Second, sun protective clothing. 
When you're at the beach, use rash guards, leggings, hats, and sunglasses with a UPF of 50 or greater. And finally, don't forget to visit your friendly dermatologist for your, your yearly or your biannual or your quarterly skin check. And if all of these things are done, we can definitely decrease the rates of skin cancer and improve the quality of our patients' lives. Thank you for your attention and here's to excellent sun protection.